Good evening, everyone. My name is Amanda Thomas, and I would love to welcome you to Science on Tap. We are here with my, one of my very favorite authors, Mary Roach, to talk about her new book, uh, Fuzz, the uh, When Nature Breaks the Law. I've got a copy here. And I encourage you all to pick up a copy as well. It's wonderful. You should get all of her books. She's fabulous and funny and yeah, it's great. And we're very happy to have her back. We've had her here in Portland a couple of times before. And uh, if you go to our website or if you check for our podcast um, called A Scientist Walks Into a Bar, you can hear a recording of the talk that we had back in 2017 about her book, Grunt. So that one was fun as well. So uh, I'm just going to tell you a few things about what to expect this evening um, for those of you who are new to Science on Tap. And let's see, moving forward, maybe my slide will move. Okay, so briefly, if you order uh, Fuzz through Broadway Books, uh, their website, we'll put that in the chat, you can get a 15% discount through uh, November 5th if you use the code S. T fuzz 15 so I encourage you to support a local business here in Portland and get your book through them. For those of you who are new to science on tap, this is a picture of Mary and me on on stage at the uh, Alberta Rose Theater a number of years ago. This is what we hope to get back to at some point. We are a science education uh, event series for adults. Our goal is to make science uh, accessible, fun and meaningful, um, especially for adults. And we often will encourage you to have a pint of, of uh, whatever your favorite beverage is when you are at one of our events. And uh, we're based in Portland, Oregon, and um, but we have lots of people uh, watching from all over the world. Um, and uh, I encourage you to, in the chat, if you haven't already, please put your um, location, uh, your zip code if you're here in the United States, or if you are outside of the country, I'd love to know what city and country you are watching from. And also, if you missed any of our previous events, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel uh, at science on, or I'm sorry, youtube.com slash science on tap ORWA. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and welcome our speaker this evening, Mary Roach. Welcome to Portland by proxy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda. It's lovely to be here by proxy. I have my Science on tap, my <laughs> lovely. I have two of these and uh, I have filled it up for the occasion. So um, great to be back. It, I love the series and it's always so much. I wish I could be there in person, but we will do this in the future yes. together in yes. person. <laughs> we, as as we talked about, we had hoped that this would be our first uh, live event in person back in theaters, and unfortunately that, that didn't happen, obviously. So, but we're thrilled to have you here. I have lots of things I want to ask you about this book and, and some other books. Also, I want to ask other folks uh, or mention it to our audience as well. If you've got questions about some of the other books, feel free to, to drop those in the Q&A as well, and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Um, okay, so... I'm going to start with a question that I'm sure everyone asks, but we got to get it out of the way. And how did you come up with the idea for this book? Um, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, I do get asked that a lot, and I don't. I wish that I had the uh, the tidy and fascinating origin story, the, the inspiration moment. Um, I don't really. I, I rarely have a moment of inspiration. It's more uh, a process of stumbling around and running into walls and thrashing around and then finally just sitting down on something and going, oh, I guess this is it. Um, but this one happened. Um, I, I got interested in um, wildlife crime of a different sort, uh, the kind where the wildlife are the victims. So uh, endangered, animals, uh, you know, endangered species being um, smuggled across borders, used medicinally, illegally, that kind of thing. There's a forensics lab up in uh, Ashland, Oregon that um, does a lot of really interesting work. Uh, there's a woman there, Bonnie Yates, who wrote a paper called How to Distinguish Real Versus Counterfeit Tiger Penis. And that was, um, it's, a, it's both a paper and also a guide for wildlife law enforcement people. It's about eight pages long. Uh, and I, I don't honestly remember how I stumbled onto this paper, but I got intrigued and that's I had a conversation with Bonnie. I actually went up to the um, 
forensics lab, because uh, it's kind of like how I find my topics. I never think of an idea like for a book. I find a couple of chunks that are interesting. And then I think, well, what would be the book that would go around that well, or those chunks? And then I'd have to find, you know, another 10 chunks <laughs> to fill it in. But uh, so I went up there and she showed me a lot of dried penises. She showed me her hair library, which is, you know, she's able to identify um, bits and pieces of animals by their hair, which is very complicated because they have regular hair, guard hair, whiskers, downy under fur. Anyway, we had a great afternoon and I thought, wow, this is kind of cool. And then I went in to talk to the director and he said, uh, there's no way you can tag along with an investigator on an open investigation. That's illegal. So the door kind of slammed shut because I really, for my books, need to be on the scene. I want to be reporting in person and <clears throat> following things as they happen. So that was a dead end. But uh, uh, I, I started thinking about um, what if you turned it inside out and wildlife were the perpetrators rather than the victims. And this was this came about partly because I found this book from 1906 called The Criminal Prosecution and Capital Punishment of Animals, which is a very strange book. Um, I at first thought maybe it was a hoax. Uh, it's from 1906 and it details uh, uh, cases where uh, animals were put on trial had legal representation, were sometimes um, executed, uh, other times not. Uh, so that kind of sealed the deal for me. And I started thinking, well, um, what is the science here? The science turns out to be something called human wildlife conflict, but that is you know, kind of a textbooky term. And I thought it would be more fun to kind of you know, break it down by crime. So we have in the first half of the book, manslaughter, breaking and entering, home invasion, Grand Theft Sunflower Seed, and then with the, the, the misdemeanors in the second half or more, uh, we've got you know, trespassing, vandalism, littering, that kind of thing. And animals do all of that. Um, obviously, they're not really breaking the law because the laws are not written for them and they're just following their instincts. But for me, it was just a way to kind of make it a little more, um, this is a, a way to package these challenges of, of you know, people and wildlife kind of getting in each other's way. So, so it started with the tiger penises. <laughs> and I am, in, uh, incidentally, quite good now at distinguishing real versus fake tiger penis. If we have time later, I can tell everybody how to do that and why you might want to. We, we will make some time for that later. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I... I've read all of your books. They're fabulous. And again, any of you watching who haven't read her books, um, I highly recommend that. Um, but most of your other books are mostly uh, are pretty much people centered. So whether they're dead or not, um, or, you know, but they, or, but the, the elementary canal and, and, or astronauts or whatever, how was this different writing about animals as kind of the protagonist in some cases? Yeah, well, it, it, it is ultimately about people too. I mean, I, there's the, the, each chapter I'm spending time with somebody who, while they deal with animals, they, they themselves are kind of um, the main feature. I mean, it's, it's, it's about the conflict between the two, but uh, humans play into it. But I see, I, I know what you're saying. I mean, my books have focused specifically on, on the human body, either human body, some element of it, or the human body in kind of extreme circumstances like space or combat. Um, and I, uh, in part, it's just that the human body is, is finite real estate. And I kind of have used the roachable parts of it, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do neurology. We have wonderful neurologists like Oliver Sacks, well, he's no, no longer with us, but David Eagleman, uh, people who this is their world and they know it really well and I wouldn't trespass there. Um, there's, so so it was kind of, um, you know, people would write to me and say, well, I, you should write a book about hair <laughs> or, you know, it kind of was scraping the bottom of the barrel. Well, so apparently I, there's a lot to know about animal hair. So maybe. You know. Well, they, yes, <laughs> this is true. You, I mean, you could, maybe not a whole maybe, book, though. <laughs> maybe not. But honestly, I, I sometimes feel it'd be fun if somebody just said to me, 
okay, I'm going to give you a topic and you have to write a book on it. Because I think if you scratch the surface and you dive in, everything is interesting. You know, just like the, I don't know, the street sign on the corner or, or um, I, I'm just grasping it. Just like really anything, if you start to, if you, if you dive in and, and uh, go down the rabbit hole and learn more about it, the history of it, um, people whose jobs revolve around it. I, I honestly think that would be kind of a fun, you know, somebody just said eggs, you have to write like egg. Is that, an egg is a good word. Maybe my next book should be <laughs> eggs. Yeah. Anyway. I remember years ago reading a, a review of, I can't, I don't even know what decade it was. It, it was a while ago, but somebody saying um, that they loved your writing so much that they, if you wrote a book on Quonset huts, they would read it. They, cause they, oh, yeah. they, they knew that you would find a good way to, to talk about that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Fun. That's the guy who wrote the year of living, uh, AJ Jacobs, who's a, a, a very funny writer as well. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. <laughs> and that made me think Quonset, maybe that was why I wrote grunt. Maybe in yeah. the back of my mind, I'm like <laughs> Quonset huts, I'll do it. <laughs> Well, so you, you talked about the first half of the book being more uh, felony crimes and using crimes yeah. loosely, obviously, um, like, you know, a bear killing somebody, whether by accident or, or otherwise. Um, but then you also have things like death by tree. And I'm wondering how you found some of the more esoteric topics. Sure. Well, um, the tree chapter and to a greater extent, the, the terror beans chapter, those are in right, there. The, terror beans. the yeah. beans. Yeah. Uh, partly because this book was originally called um, animal, vegetable, criminal. And that is still the title in the UK, confusingly, because mm -hmm. the both, they're both out now. So I'm like retweeting things going, this is the UK version. <laughs> I haven't written another <laughs> book, but um, so what happened was uh, in February, we were just getting, you know, getting ready to go to print. And uh, Mark Bittman, the New York Times food writer and cookbook author, a uh, big best-selling cookbook author, wrote, uh, put out a, a history of food entitled Animal Vegetable Junk. So it, it um, my publisher felt that it would be a mistake to come after that and seem like we had kind of stolen the idea. They thought it would be confusing for the sales reps. I, I, whatever, they had their reasons. Um, so we uh, went back to, Fuzz was on the book proposal in the beginning. So we kind of went back to that. So because it had been animal, vegetable, criminal, I am answering your question in my roundabout blathering way, uh, because it had been animal, vegetable, criminal, and I turned the book in and the trees were in there because I had to have some vegetable matter because animal vegetable criminal and then my editor said mary i don't think there's enough vegetable <laughs> material in here can you add something this is you know the book is already done and uh so uh that's how the, the beans got added just because uh um to kind of justify the word vegetable in the title so i kind of wrote the book around the title uh in in the, in, in the case of those two chapters so um that's why i mean i think i might have uh I might have just stuck to animals, but the danger trees were uh, in particular were really uh, fascinating. And I was very drawn in just by the term danger tree. The fact that that's a category, it's, it's right. like danger mitten, <laughs> you know, it's such a danger tree, you know, it's, uh, um, so, uh, and, it, it, and as, it, as it happened, there was um, some danger tree mitigation going on up in British Columbia in this uh, old stand of old legacy uh, uh, Douglas firs. So it was, um, I was able to spend time with a danger tree faller blaster, which was very cool. Just um, for the title. So, uh, yeah, just for the title. They, they, in, in, up in uh, Canada, they call lumberjacks, not loggers, they call them fallers. So their business cards have things like falling supervisor. <laughs> <laughs> like falling supervisor. They don't think it's funny at all because it's just, you know, that's how they use that word. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but I found it kind of hilarious. That it, that's great. Um, 
Yeah, I, I just back to the book title. I you were on one of my favorite podcasts, uh, No Such Thing as a Fish, yes. recently, which I got to ask you about that later. But um, yeah, they they mentioned that it was Animal Vegetable Criminal, which I thought was also a great title. So I I think that you have two great options, if slightly <laughs> confusing, I suppose. But yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that podcast too. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so the the second half of the book, as you mentioned, is more about misdemeanors type crimes. So right. theft, vandalism, that sort of thing. And it seemed like a lot of the things that you were talking about was basically just scaring animals um, to make them not be where you don't want them to be. Um, and I love the idea of scary man. Um, <laughs> but I wonder, scary man. Yeah, I'm wondering if yeah. you can talk about that specifically, but then maybe some other thoughts on, on how to scare animals or what oh, worked yeah. or what didn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking about scaring. The, the ancient art of bird scaring um, yeah. is uh, very few people have asked about that, that section. And, and um, uh, to me, it's just, it's kind of fascinating because um, it's very easy to startle and it, it, to scare birds away, to startle them. Um, but it's really difficult to keep them away. And this is true of some uh, other animals as well. Um, but that, but because they start to call your bluff, you know, you can, you know, it, it, it's not going to take very long before they figure out that is actually not all that scary. So like, you know, the, the owl that you put up that was supposed to scare, keep pigeons away. Um, uh, this researcher did a study where he used um, a, a high fidelity, uh, like a really realistic, it was a taxidermied, there were certain raptors that would be frightening to smaller birds. And he looked at how long uh, this kept the birds away. And the answer was five to eight hours. <laughs> so, um, and the internet is full of uh, photographs of pigeons sitting on top of those uh, scary owls. And uh, Canada geese lounging in the shade of those plexiglass coyotes that are supposed to scare them away. So it's so it is um, it's it's quite difficult to do. So the things that work, weirdly, people don't quite understand why. Um, and, and the same you know, loud noise is the same thing. It'll it'll startle them. They'll fly away, but they'll come back. So loud noises are sort of temporarily uh, effective, but they're um, annoying to people who live in the neighborhood. And very quickly, the birds. Um, uh, get used to it and ignore it. So um, the, one of the things that does work, uh, for, uh, especially for vultures, um, because vultures have a tendency to roost in large numbers in places that people don't want them to. For example, communications towers, they tend to be on there. And if someone needs to work on the tower, it's very unpleasant because vultures, uh, first of all, they're crapping all over. So the, the things that you climb up are covered in vulture crap. And also vultures, when they're threatened, they, they have a reaction uh, that they vomit. So you've got this rain of, of vomit. So it's coming, coming from down. both sides. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but by accident, someone discovered that um, a, a vulture, a dead vulture hanging upside down with its wings out, hang, kind of twisting in the breeze, a vulture effigy, it's called, is very effective. And it's effective for a long time. Uh, and nobody quite knows why. You can kind of anthropomorphize and, and imagine that, well, if you came into a neighborhood and saw a person hanging from a tree by their feet, you would get out of town too. But you know, that's not necessarily how, I mean, who knows what the vultures are thinking, but it seems to work. Um, and it's used in, vultures are really weird creatures. There's a, um, <laughs> They have this habit in uh, down in Florida, Everglades. Their cars and go into the Everglades to fish or whatever. And um, vultures tend to come in and they will pull off uh, they'll, the rubber off of wind, the windshield wiper. They'll rip the, the uh, seal around the sunroof. Uh, and there's been research into you know, why they do that. It's a bit of a mystery still. Uh, but anyway, um, the folks at the Everglades at the you know the visitor center there tried effigies and they you know, hung these vultures and you can use kind of a styrofoam body with just the wings so it lasts longer, it doesn't rot as quickly. So they hung these, but they're very realistic. They look like dead vultures hanging by their feet. They hung them up around the perimeter of this drive, of this parking lot and it worked wonders. Unfortunately, now the rangers spend all their time 
uh, explaining to visitors who are freaked out why there are dead vultures hanging from the trees. So they finally uh, took the effigies down because they got sick of that and just put up a sign saying, here are some tarps. Put a tarp on your car, otherwise vultures will rip apart your windshield wipers. Um, so, so the things that work uh, uh, are, are kind of a mystery. Lasers also, you know, a laser kind of spinning around um, will uh, keep some birds away, uh, particularly in certain, you know, like in low light conditions. And it's not clear uh, why. There is a theory that it's because and, and green lasers in particular that the bird, that some birds see the see it as a, a solid object coming toward them, like a stick coming toward them. They see mm. this light beam that way. This is called the stick effect. <laughs> um, Very official sounding. Yeah, yeah, it's the stick effect. Um, so they the, the lasers seem to work, but only you know, certain wavelengths and for certain species and certain conditions. So it's kind of a the whole thing is sort of mysterious, uh, um, the whole uh, business of scaring birds away. I spent time in at, at the Vatican um, for <laughs> Easter because there had been a situation where gulls were coming in and vandalizing the floral display that is set up before uh, Easter Mass. Uh, and this is a very elaborate, you know, like 6,000 daffodils and almost as many roses and, a van, and uh, you know, multiple florists setting it up. And about two hours before the public was supposed to come into the square to hear the Pope say Easter Mass, these gulls came in and just like tore things apart, knocked things over, and, and it didn't eat. They weren't eating things. They wasn't a gull, the, the daffodils are poisonous, in fact. Um, it, it just appeared to be vandalism. But anyway, so they said they had brought somebody down who's invented a laser scarecrow. It's basically you know, this white structure and has these um, green lights spinning around that um, are meant to frighten the gulls. So they had those set up, but um, I kind of wondered why, because it's not a terribly large area, they could have used what was used um, hundreds of years ago and is still uh, used today, which in some, on some farms, which is called a human bird scarer. And that is a person running around or driving an ATV uh, and making loud noise and shouting and just scaring them off. So they could have just had one of those guys in the striped uniform, the Swiss guard, you know, with the knickers, the striped <laughs> knickers, just hire one of those guys to spend the night and just shoo away the birds if they show up. They didn't, they didn't really actually need to ship down two. They had two laser scarecrows and uh, the inventor, but it, uh, you know, it made for an interesting Made for a more interesting story for me, but uh, um, but a human bird scare <laughs> uh, can be effective. They've been tested uh, in England. Human bird, the human bird scare, which is somebody who drives around on an ATV uh, in the farmland scaring away birds, was more effective than the. Um, it, they often use loud noises, propane cannons. So that was the human bird scare. It was more cost effective and more uh, um, and worked just as well as the propane cannon. So. Anyway, bird scaring. Yeah. Um, well, in in the the chapter where you were talking about the sunflower seeds, um, my recollection was the actual amount that the birds got. Now, the the Vatican thing is a, a different situation, mm -hmm. but in terms of of birds eating a crop that would then be sold, it was actually not that much, right? Um, yeah. I mean, it was. It, it's a lot of sunflower seed. I mean, it's a hell of a job trying to keep birds from eating. Bird seed basically is what they're doing because the, the sunflower growers, they're in North and South Dakota, right in the path of millions of migrating blackbirds, grackles, starlings. Um, so it's a, it's a tough thing to do, and um, it's a, it's like one to two percent of the crop in some cases. So it's a significant amount, but um, the way to deal with it, yeah, the better way to deal with it is to um, manipulate the environment or the crop. You know, rather than trying to scare away, uh, to scare away the birds, or even you know, as was done in the past, just to try to kill as many as you could, which is not effective. When you're talking, you know, ten or twenty million birds, um, killing one million of them uh, doesn't make it doesn't translate into um, less, you know, less, less loss. 
Uh, well, it doesn't, and it, it barely dents the population. You know, there's going to be just as many of them the following year. Well, and you quoted, uh, and I can't remember his name, Robinson, thing like that, talking about um, mm -hmm. compensatory reproduction and mm -hmm. natality is more effective than fatality. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah, Weldon Robinson, yeah, he's, he's someone who worked for many years for the National Wildlife Research Center, which is owned by the USDA. And um, the research goes toward tr trying to um, l lower the amount of um, crop losses. Basically, it's in service of agriculture. And uh, he's someone who noticed over the course of a long, long career that when um, that that nature has a way of compensating is what he was saying. That that when you um, when you lower a population, when you you know you when there are fewer animals competing for the food, the ones that are left have more food and they do better. And when animals uh, are doing better, when the environment is serving them well, they um, they tend to have uh, larger broods. Or uh, and or shorter gestation period. That's how you end up um, sometimes with these um, plagues of mice. Like there was one happening earlier this year in Australia, uh, and they're just massive numbers, like rivers of mice in the extreme cases, um, because it's a it's a year when there's just a tremendous amount of food available to them um, for whatever reason, and they um, they start having bigger litters and and um, the gestation period shortens and they're just reproducing like crazy, taking advantage of the bounty that they, for whatever reason, um, have been handed. Um, you talked in a couple of different situations about uh, different attempts to offer some kind of uh, uh, reproductive uh, oral contraception, or I was going to say family planning, but that's not <laughs> really, that's not, uh, sure. Austin, I'll take that. Sure. Yeah. But with, I believe with macaques and with rats and with mice, with mm -hmm. the gene therapy and, mm -hmm. and, um, can you talk a little bit about some more? Sure. About that? Sure. Um, family planning is a, uh, a more humane approach mm -hmm. to overpopulous animals that are causing, uh, damage to crops or, or whatever they're doing that is irritating humans. Um, uh, it has its challenges though. I mean, a, a, an oral contraceptive, uh, as you can imagine, it would be tough uh, with a free ranging population uh, to how do you make sure each individual is consuming the right amount? You know, how do you keep one greedy individual from eating all the bait? Because it would be delivered in a tasty bait. Uh, and how do you prevent other species, non-target species, from eating that bait, and you know, we don't, you know those are populations you don't want to interfere with them. So uh, a pill, uh, something to swallow, is not a good option. Um, there are immunocontraceptive vaccines that uh, that do work, but they also have their challenges. Uh, as of now, um, most of them, or all of them, there's one kind of in the works. But, but all of them require a booster shot, which is, as we know, common with vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, so with a free ranging population like the macaques in New Delhi, you'd have to uh, give, you know, you'd have to round them up somehow, uh, give them one shot and then somehow get them back uh, and know which one has had the, you'd have to tattoo them or give them or in some way, mark them ear tag so that you know which ones have had a booster already. Uh, so it's it's a lot of work. It's very expensive, and it's not permanent. Um, and so I mean, there are some that are you know if you can do a booster, you know if you have a closed population like sewer rats, where you you can and there are um, there are some um, bait scenarios that that are being tried that that as supposedly have some success, and there is. The Bureau of Land Management is looking at um, a one-shot uh, contra immunocontraceptive vaccine for, I think it's for wild horses. So there's a lot of work going on with fertility control. And I think that's, you know, I think that um, we'll be there within the decade. And, and um, but again, it's, you know, it's, it's easier to do with, a, with say, a population on an island 
like wild horses on Assateague Island is one instance where they've been used as you, um, otherwise it's, it's a tremendous amount of time to just, you know, tracking them down and, and figuring out who's, you know, who's had what. Um, but it is a, a, a promising, it is a promising approach and it's um, a little nicer than some of the other things that are done. Um, the very, uh, the, the far in the future and the, the more extreme version, I guess you'd say extreme, um, is um, a gene drive, genetic modification and a gene drive. And that would be a situation uh, where you would <clears throat> do a manipulation, a genetic manipulation such that um, uh, one example would be you'd create females that, that only give birth to males. So you, once you have you know, all males, obviously that's kind of the end point of that population. It's something that's um, been considered for uh, invasive species on an island that are um, decimating populations of local uh, native uh, animals. They're often rodents. Um, so uh, the gene drive element is that you would, <clears throat> this would, um, that trait would spread more thoroughly. Like it wouldn't just be half the population, it would be carried forth in all of the offspring. So it would very quickly, it would, it would be, uh, it would take effect far more quickly. Um, so, um, and that's something that is not being done now, but being looked into. And, um, you know, it's, um, it's something that, you know, I, I could, I can understand, you know, on an isolated Island, you know, trying to save, say seabirds that are being wiped out by rodents that have, you know, come off of ships. Um, but ultimately I think that, you know, the, it's the USDA that is doing some work and I think that the that what they're looking toward in the future is is using it on some um, agricultural pests and if you look at the list of you know what what species are considered pests by the USDA and the Department of Health and Human sort of human the health department um, it's kind of a surprisingly diverse list I mean, you've got you know chipmunks and bobcats and cormorants and swans and I mean and, uh, so when you start letting the bottom line of agriculture decide what's a pest and what can be curtailed in that way it's a little disconcerting um but it, yeah so they're they're um pretty tough challenges uh you know figuring out how to do something effective and also something humane and something that's uh, ethically acceptable right yeah, I you don't talk about it in the book specifically, but I know I've heard something about them trying to do that with mosquitoes as well, mm -hmm. trying to to only breed males. I think. So, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I don't know where things are at. Well, I think they have done that somewhere. Yeah. Um, again, I think on an island, perhaps. I think there was a. Uh, I think the uh, there was a. They're talking about that with ticks. I think on an mm. island off the east coast, perhaps. Um, but I'm I'm not up on the. Uh, insect, but I think you know in, insects is where you will sort of see that first. But there's still kinks to be worked out. The the, the gene wasn't copying correctly. Um, you also have to um, you have you're creating these gene drive organisms, and then you have to sort of seed the population with these new gene drive creatures. And and the you have to you know these are lab these are lab animals, and these are there's a big difference between you know lab mice and wild mice, and and there's a concern they might not even breed with each other because they're that different. So there's all kinds of um, hurdles uh, that, that are, our scientists are dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I love about your books is that you are, you don't shy away from the um, taboo topics like poop and sex and things like that. <laughs> and, um, and you spent some time with a wildlife expert tracking a mountain lion in California. Mm -hmm. Is that Am yes. I, yeah. That's um, right. And you spent some time um, examining mountain lion poop, I believe. And <laughs> um, and I'm I I'd love to hear about that experience. But also, I mean, obviously, it it, it um, is something that is funny and appealing, and you know, just uh, is amusing. But do you have any? Why do you include that kind of stuff? Is that just to to appeal to some people like me, or is is there a, a greater? <laughs> um, plan you have well in the case in this case it's a chapter that had to do with how to how do you count 
how do you count a population that's in the that's in the wild? Particularly, uh, mountain lions are incredibly stealthy. It is, I mean, you you even if you're someone who spends a great deal of time in the woods, you'll probably never stumble onto a mountain lion. They don't want to be seen, uh, and they're very good at hiding. So to try to count, uh, and, and the uh, state of California is trying to do a, a survey of the entire state and the population. And um, one of the ways to do that, um, it's called, uh, it's capture recapture where you're, uh, well, it's kind of a long story and it involves formulas, but um, one of the, now that we have um, genetic analysis, uh, a much easier way to do this in the future would be to have do to dogs that are trained to recognize the scat, uh, a mountain lion poop, basically. So you let the uh, dogs, you know, the dogs go out and they're searching for the scat. So then um, once it's been located by the dog, it's collected by people, re researchers, um, people who work for the state. And then you bring all those samples back and you can do a DNA analysis and, and you can get your population that way. So it's a much, um, um, less time consuming, less manpower uh, way of doing it. So, uh, and then I just had a section on just the many uses in science, uh, particularly in you know, the early naturalists, the, how useful SCAT was. Um, so it's in there because it fit, um, but also, you know, it's the, the, particularly some of the, the older stuff on, on SCAT was kind of entertaining. So, um, <laughs> It didn't have to be in there, but it certainly, you know, it, it, and, and that's what was going on. Um, the, the researcher that I traveled with, the one who was doing the survey, um, the tracker um, is um, going, is doing an experiment where they're going to compare, you know, the effectiveness, you know, of, do, of the methods that he's using with um, the scat dogs to just see, to see if it's valid and to see if it's accurate. And if it is in the future, um, this researcher, researcher, Justin Dellinger, will be replaced by piles of shit. <laughs> <laughs> How does he feel about that? Uh <laughs> um, that's what I said. I, I think I said you're gonna be because he loves what he does. He's really good at it. And he's an amazing tracker. It's just he just reads the forest in a way that is uncanny. The stuff that he um the way that he can see things in the landscape that um, that indicate, you know, the presence of a cougar, uh, you know, and, and to know when they were there, what sex were they, how, what age were they? It's incredible, the stuff that he can learn. And I said, you know, you, you're going to miss that, aren't you? And he said, he said, no, you know, I, I can use my time to focus on better ways to deal with, you know, people and cougars getting in each other's worlds. And so, um, but deep down, yeah, I think he'll miss it. <laughs> Well, speaking of folks who are out in, you know, looking for signs of things, you spent some time, the first chapter of your book is about the, where's my note, the wildlife human attack response training in, uh, that was held in, at a casino in Reno, I think, right? And, That's right. Yeah. Can you, we, we've had a number of events about crime scene investigation, and those are always popular. Uh, yeah. So can you talk about WART and how, what you, what you learned there? Yeah, sure. Uh, it, it really is a crime scene investigation training. It's five days. Part of it is in the classroom and part of it is out in a simulated um, attack scene, crime scene, crime scene. So it's, um, and I had no idea that um, when someone is killed by an, a wild animal, that this, uh, the, the procedure is very similar. There's a lot of overlap with the procedure that um, it happens when a person is killed by another person. So you have this, you have this scene where you, you have the yellow tape and you have people collecting evidence, putting the evidence flags down uh, and examining um, the victim's body. And uh, there's a difference in that, in this case, um, the first thing you're gonna do is try to, you have to figure out what species it was. Was it a cougar? Was it a bear? Was it a human? Because there's been instances where uh, an animal, it's been accused basically of a murder that in the end it turned out not to have committed and vice versa. A person was accused of a killing um, when in fact it was a dingo. That's um, Lindsay Chamberlain, the famous dingo ate my baby 
that well, that one. Uh, so it's um, so it's really interesting. You're looking at the you, you know you're we learned the telltale signs of a cougar versus a bear attack. Um, you know you can tell just by the style of the animal that the bears um, bears use the same tactics they would use when they fight with each other. They go mm. right for the face because the face is lightly furred. They go like tooth, teeth to teeth. And um, unfortunately for the uh, victim, they, that's what they tend to do to the person as well. So they, and we had these soft, the, the, the people who did the course had these soft touch mannequins that they had um, doctored to, to recreate the wounds of actual uh, attack victims. So they were... Um, Fairly, fairly gory. Um, uh, so we were looking at those and learning about, you know, how do you tell, you know, um, and also looking at is this post mortem or peri mortem? Like, in other words, did it happen? Um, were these wounds hap did they happen during the attack, or were they possibly caused by a scavenger who came along after the person had been killed, say, um, say shot or what, you know, killed by a human or died of natural causes? So. Even if, even if there's marks of an animal feeding on the person, it doesn't mean the animal killed that person. Um, so that, that was really fascinating as well. And, and, and then they try to establish, you know, if they do catch an animal, if they have a suspect, you know, if they've put a, say a culvert trap out and they've got a bear uh, caught, um, or say it was shot on the scene of the um, attack, they would then uh, compare DNA uh, between the victim and the animal. And uh, if it's not a match, then the animal is released from custody. Uh, and that's, uh, I, I didn't realize that either, that, that, you know, they go to that, that that much effort is taken to make sure they have the correct uh, perpetrator. But it's fascinating. I mean, we were looking at blood spatter patterns and, you know, scuffle marks and, you know, collecting evidence and little baggies and doing all of that. But in, a, in the fact that it was taking place in a in a casino in Reno was kind of surreal. <laughs> and we were, our classroom was a large conference room, but it was next to another conference room in which there was a bingo game going on. <laughs> so the bingo people would like every now and then go down the hall to the end of the hall to the bathroom and just sort of look in and like at a glance, I don't know what they thought, just, you know, because there's a lot of very realistic naked mannequins with, you know, they're scalped and bloody. <laughs> so um, uh, who knows what those people thought? Yeah, I, I, this is a bit of a grim topic, but you often um, face those kinds of things head on. So I'll go ahead and go there. Um, you were saying in the episode, or the episode, in the chapter about um, the leopards and the, the ones who uh, sometimes take human Mm -hmm. um, uh, or attack humans, that there was an assumption that the leopards kind of got the gist of humans or got the taste, I guess, during the 1918 flu pandemic, if, if I'm remembering correctly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm, and I'm, I'm wondering, obviously you were there traveling before COVID, but I'm wondering, have you heard anything? Is there any kind of similar kind of thing going on? Um, no, I haven't heard any, uh, anything about, um, I mean, th those, um, I'm not sure the COVID rates in, in the middle Himalaya got that mm, high, fair. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is that this was all, it was already happening. People, people in that, and it's very specific to that region of India. Um, there are leopards further South, but they very rarely, um, attack and kill someone. So that, so that, yeah, there's this, um, uh, book called The Man-Eating Leopard of Rudra Prayag, and it's written by Jim Corbett, who was a hunter who was brought in to uh, kill uh, this one particular leopard. But, and it was his, he's the one who had the theory that during the um, flu pandemic of 1918, there were so many people dying so quickly that the normal funer funeral rite of bringing the body down to the Ganges and doing the cremation there, there was a sort of expedited version where they would put a burning coal in the mouth and sort of roll the body down the hill. It's very steep down to the Ganges. Um, and that there were a lot of bodies out on the landscape and that that's how leopards sort of developed a taste. 
or humans. So that was his theory. Of course, you have to ask the leopards. Uh, but there's other answering. things going. Yeah, that um, more recently, there's been a lot of uh, out migration, people, um, particularly men leaving small villages to find jobs in cities. And so there, um, there are still people, there's still livestock, but there's fewer people guarding them and, and younger people. So children may be out um, guarding livestock. Uh, that, so with, um, with fewer people watching the animals, the leopards have been taking advantage of that and taking, um, taking livestock, but then also, especially in the case of a child who's, who's out tending the flock, um, the, the children, I mean, 40% of the uh, people who are stalked by leopards, there are kids um, you know, uh, under 10 years old. So um, it's, that's the feeling that it's, it, it, it has more to do with that. And also um, the farm, because the, the cropland, these terraces where they used to farm, it's very difficult to farm on terraces, but that's been, that's been rewilding. So there's a lot more shrub and cover and a lot of places for the leopards to hide. And that is because leopards like mountain lions, they need cover to stalk and you know, they kind of creep up close and then you know, a burst of speed and then they pounce. They're not long distance um, mm -hmm. stalkers and they don't you know, run a tremendous distance. They want to sneak up unseen. So um, all of the rewilding has, has um, enabled some of that. So, so that's probably more contributive than anything happening with COVID, yeah. That's but, good, I suppose. Yeah, um, uh, but it's, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I don't actually know the answer to that. I didn't hear anything about um, the COVID rates up there. I mean, the villages are very small, but uh, yeah, and people spend a lot of time outdoors too. There's other kitchens are outdoors, you know, which probably <clears throat> limits the, the transmission there. I have to say that as you were talking about uh, leopards sneaking through the underbrush, um, my I have three cats and the little black one that looks like a panther um, just walked in the room. So she may be making an appearance at some point. I don't know. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm sure that you always find way more information than you can actually put in your books. Um, and I, I'd love to hear some of, of the stuff that you weren't able to include either because I didn't make a full chapter or just didn't fit yeah. somewhere, but yeah. Can you, can you spill uh, the, sure. Spill the sure. terror beans on that a little bit? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I wanted, I, I, I had, I had planned to do a Canada goose chapter. I wanted to become a, um, a trained egg addler. Uh, egg addling is something that municipalities tried a few years back to, you know, to control the population of Canada geese. Um, mainly just because Canada geese, um, they tend to uh, besmirch uh, playgrounds, golf courses, parks. Um, they crap quite a bit. So, um, an egg addling is—it's not. It's basically you're shaking an egg or, or oiling it, and so the uh, the embryo is it an embryo inside an egg? So. I think so. Uh, would either uh, would would die, and a lot, tremendous amount of effort went into um, figuring out how to detect how old is that embryo, and uh, at, at what point is it humane to do that? So it's almost like goose abortion. You know, it's like. It, 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 you know, and, and you, the way that you do that, you have a bucket of water and you put the egg in and if it floats, it means there's more air than goose in there. So that's considered, um, you know, early enough that it's, it's humane to do the egg addling. But it's, it's, it's tricky to do because you have to time it right. If you do it too soon, um, the birds will lay another clutch. Uh, it's also, um, the males are very aggressive, so you kind of have a bucket and the eggs, and meanwhile, you're, you're supposed to take an umbrella and open an umbrella at them. So the whole thing just seemed kind of comically absurd and appealed to me a great deal, but no, mm -hmm. nobody's doing egg addling anymore. I couldn't find anybody anywhere who was going to have a training and be doing egg addling. I think they're also removing nests is an is, is approach that they're trying um, in some places, but anyway... So much for Canada geese. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, I looked into um, baboons at one point, but then macaques ended up taking that slot. 
uh, I wanted to look at, uh, what else was I gonna have in there? Oh, I, I wanted to include something on um, this raging debate among certain naturalists in the either late 1800s, early 1900s about, uh, this was on the topic of vultures, but really not human, human wildlife conflict. So it, it didn't go in, but it was this argument back and forth, this heated argument about how do vultures find their prey from so high up? Do they smell it or do they see it? And there was this, you know, acrimonious debate going back and forth. And somebody, and I, don't, I don't think it was Audubon who was involved in this. I forget the names of the naturalists, but one of them did this experiment where they took a really uh, detailed oil painting of a dead sheep, like life size, and laid it out in a field to see if, you know, because if in fact the vultures were using visual cues, they would come down and uh, uh, see that they'd see the painting of the dead, you know, the carcass, and then they would come down. But if it was just smell, then they wouldn't. They wouldn't, they would ignore it. Anyway, I just love the idea of scientists, you know, first of all, commissioning a large <laughs> life-size painting of a rotting um, antelope carcass or whatever. I don't remember what the carcass was uh, and also dragging it out to the field. And anyway, it's just science in action. Uh, I wanted to work that in um, and, and two things. One, it's a little off topic, but also I found uh, that Radiolab had done an episode that mm. had to do with that. And I thought everybody will assume that I stole it from Radio Lab, so I left it out. <laughs> Another good podcast. Um, <laughs> yes. So I want to encourage folks, if you have any questions about this book or about any of Mary's other books, go ahead and put those in the Q&A because we're going to get to some audience questions here in a little bit. So go ahead and do that. Um, but I have more questions. Uh, do you have a favorite word or favorite concept that you learned as a result of doing the research for this book? I love the word kerf and kerf is a word that it's the, um, if you have a saw blade cutting into a piece of lumber or a tree, uh, that's the width of the cut. K E R F a good scrabble word kerf, uh, frass. I like also that is insect shit frass F R A W -S, S. Um, uh, what are some other words? There's another one that I'm forgetting. It'll come to me. I, you know, the, the movie um, Sideways, it's out mm -hmm. a long time ago, but mm -hmm. the, uh, I believe the, that's just a bit of trivia, I believe the um, winery he goes to and has the kind of breakdown, I believe that's called like Frass Valley or something. They, ah! they named it that because they didn't want to use a real vineyard. But anyway, yeah. So oh, that's hilarious. Frass fun. Valley. Yeah. <laughs> Assuming nobody would know. No, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty uh, unusual word. So yeah, that's fun. Yeah. I actually encountered Frass. Uh, I did a story on killer bees down in Brownsville, Texas. Oh. And the bee researcher was the one who introduced me to that. Because she was showing me honeycomb, and at the bottom of each little, what well, is each little comb? What's the little cell? Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, she goes, "That's frass." Hmm. Insect poop. Yeah. Yeah, you don't include a lot on insects in this book. And no, I'm... no, I, d I don't. And I thought about it. I thought about because um, there's some some entomologists who wrote an interesting paper, a uh, uh, long, interesting paper on uh, the ethics of pesticide and do, and, uh, but you, you know, you, in order to know if it's cruel, you have to really know what do insects feel? You know, what, what do they perceive? Um, how do they feel pain or nausea or, you know, so it's kind of a difficult thing to get a handle on. And I also thought it was, um, um, I wanted to focus on the vertebrate pests. Um, you know, there's only so much room in a book. Yeah. And if, and I think if I had found somebody who's, who's currently doing any kind of work in that area, I would have, mm -hmm. but I didn't, um, you know, that, that researcher, that was a theoretical paper. He wasn't actually doing any, um, any research in the field. So, um, that it also had that going against it. I like to have sort of something happening in the chapter. 
so we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee asking about, um, do you talk about feral cats in the book? Uh, I, I do uh, a little bit in, there's a chapter in New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand uh, has a program called Predator Free 2050. Uh, and it's an effort to, by the year 2050, eliminate um, three of the, the three mo the three main invasive species that are uh, killing native wildlife, particularly flightless birds. Uh, and that is stoats, rats, and possums. But uh, feral cats kill a large number as well, uh, not just cats that are stray and that have, you know, escaped or whatever, but also uh, cats were introduced, cats were kind of bred back in the day uh, in an effort to kill rabbits, which were overpopulous. And rabbits had been brought in from Europe for various reasons. And there are too many of them. So um, uh, New Zealanders um, imported stoats and also bred cats. So there's a tremendous, there's a tremendous number of feral cats and they kill a lot of chicks and, and um, other small creatures there. And the researcher that I spoke to um, pointed that out. He said, you know, it's kind of, you know, we've, we've got the stoats, the rats and the possums, but because people like cats, we're not really including feral cats. And he's like, I think that's a mistake. And, and he's like, um, there should, you know, people shouldn't be allowed to have cats, you know, or they keep, you know, because they're, they're not going to keep them indoors, you know, so it should be, you know, there, there should not, we shouldn't be allowing, if this is our goal, you know, to save this, these flightless birds, uh, and, and, the, and reptiles as well, there's a lot of other animals, um, then we shouldn't, we shouldn't have cats, and I'm like, good luck with that, Bruce, <laughs> yeah, good luck with that, and he's like, no, you keep the one you have, but you're just not allowed to get another one, uh, yeah, like again, yeah, but anyway, um, so it is a little hypocritical, you know, it's like, um, and dogs there kill a fair number of kiwis, uh, the dogs can be trained, like, there's like kiwi avoidance training that you can do for your dog, but but it is a you know people are very gung ho about um, killing all the rats, stoats, and possums, but don't come near my pet. <laughs> so that's you know it's uh, eh, it's just how humans are. But anyway, that is uh, the feral cat. I do talk about the feral mm -hmm. cats uh, in that chapter. I I will say I mentioned we have three cats. Um, we keep them indoors and we have a catio, so they get to go outside, but it's enclosed. So, yeah, see, yeah. people should do what you're doing. I know. <laughs> if yeah, they have I, the, I, I, you know. I kept indoors cats. I mean, I think it's if they start out indoors and they don't know, they don't know any different. Yeah. Uh, I guess you know it's it's hard to make that transition, but um, yeah, I don't know it's a tough one. Um. It, did you, uh, Angela asks, did you find any information on consistent issues with sea animals and humans? Um, sea animals. Well, um, I don't think, well, do, do gulls count as sea animals? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> um, I mean, I write about gulls and I, I do write about, I mean, one of the species that, uh, in New Zealand that is very endangered is the yellow-eyed penguin. I spent a day, uh, <clears throat> uh, a morning out of the blind watching them as they um, were uh, coming back from fishing, being out at sea, and they're extraordinary creatures. Uh, and they're, um, but it's interesting, you know, that I went there, you know, be because it had to do with predator free 2050 because stoats, there's a lot of, you know, stoats and feral cats in the area that are um, killing chicks and penguins. But then when you uh, talk to the, you know, the naturalist there, it's um, uh, also has to do with climate change in that the waters are warmer than they used to be. And the fish uh, are further out because they, they're going deeper to stay cooler and the penguins can't dive that deep. So um, and that, that, that is the theory that there are, some of them are, are starving. There's also avian diphtheria. So there's, there's a number of things happening. It's not just the stoats and cats. Anyway, so those are, I, I, didn't, I didn't spend much time on the ocean. Yeah, we have a, a question from uh, Dylan that gets to, uh, to what extent does climate change play a role in the human animal interactions yeah. you talked about? And you, you just mentioned that. So I, I yeah. imagine. Yeah, also the, um, with, with bears, um, with with the rising temperatures, the hibernation period shrinks. So mm -hmm. there's a study out of um, Colorado that uh, 
found that for every two approximately two degrees Fahrenheit increase, hibernation shrinks by about a week. Hmm. Uh, and projected out to 2050, they're saying uh, bears hibernation, black bears hibernations would be 15 to 40 days shorter. So that's that's 15 to 40 more days that they're out on the land looking for food, um, being in people's yards and cabins and things. So um, and prowling the back streets of Aspen. And prowling the back streets of Aspen. So, so yeah, I mean, I, it, you know, I, I, I didn't have climate change foremost in my mind when I began working on the book. It was kind of before things really went uh, crazy with um, heat and flooding and wildfires. Um, but it, it kind of around every corner, you would mm-hmm. run into it. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of everywhere with um, animals and the environment. So we have a couple questions about kind of your writing process and uh, somebody asks, um, let's see, uh, Carl asks, which is the, or which was the book that was the most fun to do? Oh, well, they were fun for different reasons. Uh, Packing for Mars, I I got to go on a zero gravity flight. Uh, I shouldn't say zero gravity, simulated zero gravity, um, reduced gravity, one of those planes that flies like the this. Comet. And, yeah, exactly. And it, as it goes over and down, you have 20 some seconds where you are floating. You are a soap bubble. And it, it was just awesome. I always had wanted to do that. So that particular element of that book uh, was, was about as good as it gets as a reporter, <laughs> you know, as, as a research trip. Um, I, you know, I had other challenges. NASA could sometimes be a little uh, tricky to deal with. Um, they, you know, they all had their they all had their ups and downs. But I, I think Bonk, they're just I, if just judging on the number of footnotes, and the footnotes are just this is too fun to leave out of the book. So I'm going to just put it here in a footnote. And and Bonk has twice the number of footnotes as stiff. Uh, because there's just, there was just so much, I mean, they just, you know, we did sex in the laboratory, like bringing people into the laboratory to study sex. is just, just delightfully awkward. <laughs> so, um, there was a lot of, uh, room for fun with that one, I think. Yeah. Um, that is one where you got to participate in the research, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh. Yeah. 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 Because there's only, you know, um, yeah, I, I had imagined that I would be in the room as a reporter while something was going on sexual with su- su- subjects that weren't me. But there's there's not a lot of that happening, first of all. And second of all, and, and it is happening, they don't want a reporter with a notebook in the room. So the research was like, no, you, you can't be in the room, but you can be a subject. <laughs> so uh, that had to happen. It was fun to write it up. I have to say it's pretty pretty embarrassing to do, but um, a lot of fun to write. Well, clearly we're still talking about it years (laughs) later. So it it, it made an impression. Um, Nadav asks, uh, how many, or um, so many of us read your books for pleasure. What do you like to read when you are not researching for your next book? Oh gosh, I love to read. Um, I read a lot of fiction. I have, I'm on, on Goodreads, I have all the books that I that I that are five star. So mm-hmm. I put them; they're all on there. So, um, gosh, I'd love read some recent authors that I've discovered that I hadn't known about. Um, Patrick Dewitt, who wrote The Sisters Brothers, it's a terrible movie. Do not see the movie, but the book is just it's he's a first of all he's a beautiful writer, but also just hilarious. The characters and the dialogue are really really funny. Uh, likewise, I just read. Um, Larry McMurtry, Lonesome Dove, which is not a new book. I think it's from the 70s and it's six or 700 pages, but it's so good. And he's such a good writer and the dialogue is just, and the, and the, you know, the characters are just so beautifully crafted. Um, uh, that one I really enjoyed. Uh, I just read Susan Orlean's book on animals, which is a collection of her New Yorker pieces about animals. Uh, and she's dependably fabulous uh, I, I, anything she writes. I gobble up. Uh, I'm about to read um, a collection of essays by John Mualam, who writes for the New York Times, also just a tremendous reporter and writer. And um, he 
had a book called Wild Ones, which is about people and wildlife, D different take than mine, but um, just, just a really, uh, really good book. So I read a mix of fiction and nonfiction. I'd say more fiction uh, than nonfiction. Uh, but in the nonfiction world, I uh, just recently read um, a New Yorker writer, Nicola Twilley, uh, and Jeff Mayno is her husband. They wrote a book together about quarantine, which you would think would be dull because we've lived through it. <laughs> but it's such an interesting book. It's really, really. She's the host or one of the hosts of Gastropod, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. 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 They're, they're great. Yes. He's an amazing... to a lot of podcasts, clearly. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Gastropod. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, she, yes, she's and she's an amazing reporter. And, and they spent about 10 years on this book. Just by coincidence, it came out during COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, just perfect timing. I mean, people were going into quarantine or had actually had been in quarantine for months uh, when, mm -hmm. when the book came out. It came out earlier this year. So that was, uh, but it's, it's just a, it's a fascinating book. Yeah. So I'm sure you also get this question all the time as well, but what's your next book or do you know yet? Well, I have a proposal that I, my agent has seen, but my uh, publisher hasn't seen it yet. So um, it isn't a done deal, um, but I, I'm, I'm headed in that direction, but I'm yeah, not yet. Can't talk about it. <laughs> no, no, it's a little premature. But I think, you know, if I do do it, I'm heading back to a little more familiar uh, territory, more um, having to do with um, the human entity mm -hmm. uh, rather than um, animals. Although I enjoyed my time with animals very mm -hmm. much. Well, and, and one of the things that I enjoy about your books is that you put yourself in awkward positions. You you allow <laughs> the uh, the reader to get an on to the, the situation situation that you are experiencing for the first time as well. And I'm, uh, I find that delightful and, um, just, yeah, great. So I, I can't wait to see what, what other kooky thing yeah. <laughs> that is totally fascinating, whether it's Quonset huts or not. Um, <laughs> Quonset huts. I'm going to have to do that someday yeah. from my deathbed. Uh, fake tiger penises before we wrap up, let me, Oh yes. <laughs> you were saying, uh, yeah. Okay. Can, yeah. What can you tell us about oh, that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, tiger penises, the reason anybody needs to know this is because they are sometimes sold uh, as a, as a uh, folk medicine or traditional medicine for a virility, erectile dysfunction, whatever you want to cause it. They're, they're, it's made into a, a soup. And um, if you look at the uh, things being sold as tiger penis, at which Bonnie Yates, the author of this paper, has done, um, the vast majority, happily, are not their penis. They are cow or deer or horse uh, for two reasons. One, those are easier to come by. And number two, um, they're much bigger. The tiger, the, the tiger, you know, the reason tiger is chosen is the tiger is this symbol of power and strength and potency. Uh, but the tiger has a pretty small penis. It's like that, the dried penis that I saw, it's like that. Whereas, you know, the horse, like, you know, the deer and horse are in that range. Anyway, so um, it's a little more inspirational for the person who's, you know, needing that. Okay, you do, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, but they've been doctored to look uh, like a, a felid, a cat um, penis has barbs. So the uh, horse or deer penis has to be carved with the little barbs and then hung upside down. So the barbs kind of stick out anyway. So there has to be some doctoring done. But what was interesting is that um, Dr. Yates, when she, she spent some time, I think it was in San Francisco, Chinatown, in some of the traditional medicine shops. And she said, you know, this isn't tiger penis. And they're like, yes, no, we, we know it's, it's lesser tiger penis. They know, but they sell it, they call it lesser tiger penis. Well, on behalf of all the tigers, I'm I'm appreciate that. I think that that's probably a better choice. It's yes, it's, it, we we were all delighted to learn that no tigers were, were uh, being well. They're uh, they're ha they have other problems. The tigers, but that's not one of them. Well, that's good. <laughs> So as, uh, as my final question, I have been asking all of our speakers um, or trying to ask all of our speakers as we wrap up our, our events, um, I'd love to ask you, uh, why do you think it's important for people to learn about science? Oh, gosh, because um, 
uh, people need, there's some really basic things that you learn when you learn science, um, like that are really important to, for, for people to understand. And a lot of people don't seem to understand. And that is, um, here's how we tell if something is, if, is effective, if it has an effect, we have a control group. We have a, a, a you know people people who have who are taking this pill or this treatment and people who are not. We 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 have a controlled, uh, hopefully blinded <laughs> populations, uh, and that is how we learn what medicines work. And um, people don't seem to understand that, and they they don't uh, you know. So you have situations where people are, you know. Uh, taking things like horse dewormer and going, well, God, I felt better afterwards, you know, or, or I got vaccinated five years ago and then I got diabetes. So I think it was the vaccine. Just, um, just like there's some very, very um, basic things to understand when you look at the world and how it works and what's effective and, and why you got sick. I'm obviously talking about vaccines and COVID. Uh, so, um, and these are, and these are things that you know you you. I didn't go to medical school. I just you know have a you know a little background in science. But you can get this just from reading, you know, reading good science coverage. Um, and so it's kind of a um, if you if you have this knowledge, it's a it's a shield against all this just this flood of bogus, ridiculous lies and information that are coming at us. So I, I just wish everyone had that. Yeah. Well, I think you have done a fabulous job of helping vaccinate the public <laughs> with, with your words. Uh, yeah, by, by making science so accessible to so many people. It's been a joy to, to read your books, to talk to you, um, to find out more about this book specifically and, and a little bit more about some of your other books. So thank you so much for being here and um, hopefully we'll, we will be able to do this again in person at some point soon. So thank oh, you, Mary yeah. Roach. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you so much, Amanda. I hope we are able to do it again soon. And, and you, you guys too, Science on Tap is just the most, it's a wonderful format. It's very, you know, it's, it's accessible and it's fun and people can drink a beer with their yeah. science, <laughs> which helps it go down. Yeah, so, indeed. You, you know, you're, you're doing a tremendous service as well. And it's always a pleasure. And I look forward to coming back. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. We have another book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we will have you back anytime. So thank you for being All here. Right. And um, yeah, uh, hope you have a nice break um, after your book tour. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Yeah. I have just a couple of more slides to uh, share with you just briefly. Um, first of all, I want to mention again that if you are interested in getting uh, Mary's new book, Fuzz, uh, order it from Broadway Books and you'll get a 15% discount between now and the 5th of November um, using the code STFUZZ15 and we'll put that in the chat as well. And the next book, or well, the next book, the next event we're going to be doing is on Thursday, November 18. We'll be talking about a dog's world, imagining the lives of dogs in a world without humans. And uh, we know we have a lot of dog lovers in the audience. And so I'm excited to have um, Jessica Pierce and Mark Beckoff here, well, here virtually um, to, to talk about this. So please join us for that. Quick thank you to our Patreon supporters. We've got 132, I think, at this point, which is fabulous. And these are all the wonderful folks who are donating $10 or more per month. And if you are inspired to help support um, Science on Tap, if you um, already bought a ticket, fantastic, thank you. If you feel compelled um, and want to join us on Patreon or any other kind of support, um, we could not do this without you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your questions and um, have a good evening and we hope to see you at a future event.